but uh, back 1971, uh, Brother Coy Nance, who was one of the most humble men I'd ever been around, he was pastoring the mission on Grave Street in Kernersville. And I do not know how long it had been there. It hadn't been long. Uh, they didn't have records back then. And then uh, uh, different ones had come down. He had a tremendous problem with his heart. And uh, you could see it beating. The shirt would come out as his heart would beat. And he went in the hospital. And I went down to preach for him. And he called me. And uh, he said, I'm not going to make it out of here. He said, uh, if you would, I'd like for you to carry the mission on. And at that time, when I preached, they had five people and offering was $7. And uh, I said, well, if those five want me, I said, I'll, I'll try to carry the work on. And, and the Lord has done that. I was thinking what the preacher was saying. And there's also a verse of scripture that said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I believe with all of my heart, God's been behind this all the way. I really believe that um, man that w wasn't saved. In fact, he's lived a pretty sinful life. Uh, we had saved up $2,000 and this land here was three acres, and uh, he's selling it for forty-two hundred dollars. I know you'd like to find some now for that cheap, but uh, the Lord was good to us, and two thousand's all we had. And I asked him, would he take that, you know, as a uh, faith money, and then let us come up with the other? And he took the two thousand and gave us a clear deed to the property and said, pay, pay us when you can. Now that's a man who wouldn't say, didn't know the Lord. Uh, sort of another thing that helps me know the Lord is behind all of it. And so we thank God we built that first building. Then we come in 19 and uh, 85 or 86, we were going to build this second building and uh, God opened a way for that. We had a man call us from a bank, and we went banking with him, but he said, I'd like to have some of the church business. I said, well, the church business right now is we need a loan. <laughs> and uh, he said, come get it. One of the easiest loans we've ever been able to get. Another reason I believe God was behind it. And uh, then... When we come to trying to be short, give preacher plenty of time, then we come to the uh, this building, and we wasn't able to build it at that time because the backside of our land wouldn't perk. And so I thought, well, we we can go up here to Sister Nancy and, and see about buying an uh, acre or two of her land. She had her house and five acres of land. I can't remember who went with me up there, but it was one of the deacons, and we went up there, and uh, I knocked on the door. She invited us in, and I told her why we was there, and she said, well, I'm sure glad you come. said, tomorrow I was putting a place on the market, and uh, all five acres in the house, so God opened that up for us. If anybody, I hope you're following me. God did all of it. He, he did every bit of it. Just at the right time, he always worked and, and took care of us. And so the Lord's been good. There's a lot of other things to say, but, uh, you know, we best always remember, we better remember, except Lord build the house. We better always remember that, and we better always give him the praise and the glory for everything he's done. We've had good people here. We didn't have no really rich people that give a lot of money, but we had a lot of folk that's average. Some, as far as finances go, maybe below average, 
but they give sacrificially. Now, when we built this church, the Carpenters for Christ out of Alabama come up to help us, and uh, they take a week around Father's Day every year and go somewhere to help do some work for whatever, maybe a mission home or a church, fellowship building or whatever. And so God worked in that. Uh, I think we ended up borrowing maybe it seemed like seven hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars, something like that. a little church like this, and uh, God blessed it. When they finished, it was appraised for one point three million. That was back uh, nineteen and ninety nine, and uh, so you know way things is so the values went way up God blessed if I remember the best I can this group of people uh, gave and we paid it off in seven and a half years I believe it was don't hold me to that somewhere in that area and uh, God is so good he's just so good and I thank him for him shining down upon this church. I thank him for manifesting himself and helping us. Don't you? Oh, I tell you, uh, without God's help, we couldn't do anything. And I thank him for all that he's done. One of these days, we'll be together in heaven. It's Miss Ethel, I was thinking of her this morning. She used to sing, to him, they'd sing in my... There, there'll be a homecoming. I remember that real good. And then I remember our first building, the homecoming day, we, the funeral home come, set us up a tent out there. And we had, we had a little table or two set up out there. And uh, we had a big old round uh, metal, uh, I don't know what you call it. All I just call it enough to hold a lot of good lemonade. <laughs> and uh, we had that old-fashioned lemonade, man, and it was great. And then Don took that over later, and uh, I know there's a lot of work to that, but he had, he had fixed us that old big container of lemonade, old, old big buckets, you know, full of it, ice and lemonade. Miss Don, loved Don, and... Uh, God's just been good to us through all the years and this always remember where the blessings come from. Amen. 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 There's a lot of churches out here today in the community, roundabout, different ones. Some are still existing, some probably have closed their doors, but there's a lot of churches around about that got started out of splits. I'm glad this one didn't get started out of no split, amen. Got started right, founded right, and uh, founded by a man of God, handed off to a man of God, and all that you see and all that you're a part of now, God did it. And I appreciate Brother Roger and uh, that good testimony of the history of the Welcome Door Baptist Church. Take your Bibles, if you will, with me this morning and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. Hebrews, chapter number 10. I'll begin reading here in verse number 19 in just a moment. Hey, listen, when you're, when you're remembering everybody in prayer... Um, Let's don't forget our four young people that's going to be heading off to camp in the morning. Going to be gone for the week. So uh, we want to pray for them and uh, pray for all the workers up there at the camp. It's going to have to look after them. Amen. But uh, Jenna and Sarah and Riley and Raylan are going up to camp tomorrow up in Hillsville. And I pray they have a great week and enjoy the blessings of the Lord up there uh, at the camp. Well, it's good to be saved. It's good to know whose side we're on. It's good to know who we belong to. 
Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is all about better things. All of its chapters are about how Christ is better. And uh, in this 10th chapter, and I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I, if you held me down and made me prove it, I, I couldn't. I just believe that he did. But I know that he's writing to Hebrew Christians. And uh, he's got a lot of things to share with them and to tell them. And beginning in verse number 19, I want to read down through verse number 25 for a message today as we emphasize our homecoming. In the 19th verse of Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Let's pray together, may we? Our Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you for what you started here so many years ago. Thank you, dear Lord, for the men of God that you placed over this work. Brother Coy and Brother Roger. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to continue to lead this church in the old paths, not wavering, not compromising, not changing. Lord, I know we live in an ever-changing world, and we, we're seeing things in our generation that we thought we would never see, technologies. But Lord, we're also seeing sin and transgression and rebellion and apostasy unlike we thought we would ever see in our generation. But we know that the Word of God tells us this is the way it will be in these last days. But Lord, you never change. Your Word never changes, and so we're not going to change. And Lord, what you've blessed down through the years, you'll bless today. And we just want to thank you this morning for this church and for what you've done here. And pray, Lord, that you'll continue to keep your hand upon it and bless it, and may all of us, as the members of this local assembly of believers, be faithful and true to you all the days of our life. We pray you'd bless the message now, Lord. Bless this preaching. I pray your filling of the Holy Spirit and unction and power to preach the Bible this morning, the message that you've given me to preach. And then, Lord, we look forward with great anticipation and joy of sharing a meal together in the fellowship building. Thank you and praise you for all your blessings. We love you. We exalt you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. In the, this passage of scripture that I read to you, I want you to notice first of all that in verses 19, 20, and 21, we are given uh, the accomplishments of Christ on his cross he accomplished something on that cross he didn't die for nothing amen help me out now help me out quicker I preach quicker we'll eat so help me out now the Lord accomplished quite a few things when he died on that cross for our sins verse number 19 tells us that he provided us an entrance into the holiest of holies before the Lord God by His very own blood. He opened us up a place that had been off limits to us. We as Gentiles had no rights whatsoever. This is the generation we live in of the rights of the people, the Laodicean period. But we had no rights, and Paul told us that in Ephesians, that we had 
no promises. We had no covenants with strangers and foreigners. We had no God. We had no Savior. But all of that changed when Jesus died upon the cross. And by Him giving His life and shedding His blood, (coughs) the Bible tells us that He has now given us boldness to enter into the holiest. You and I can go into the holy place of God not by our works or our religion or our spirituality, but by our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that made the way. Verse number 20, he tells us that on his cross he provided us a new covenant by dying for us in our place. He says by a new and living way, not the old way, not the law, not the animal sacrifice, not keeping the law, and not being bound up by the don't do this, don't do that, do this, do the other. No, the Bible says that He brought us a new and living way into the presence of God, and He consecrated it, He set it aside for us, for all who will believe. And the Bible says He did that through the veil that is His flesh. He died a substitutionary death. He shed holy, perfect blood so that an unperfect and unholy people could become perfect in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the new covenant. It's in His blood. Then in verse 21, the Bible says that He also accomplished a third thing, and that was He secured a high priest for us that would serve as our intercessor. The nation of Israel under the old covenant, under the law, had a high priest. And uh, they had to go through that high priest to get to God. And so you and I have a high priest. In order for us to go into the presence of God, we have to go through our high priest as well. And our high priest is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that in verse number 21. Having a high priest over the house of God... That is the Lord. All of these things he accomplished on the cross. But now if you have a habit of marking things in your Bible, I'd like to draw your attention to the very last clause of verse number 25. And that will serve as our text as well as the title of our message this morning. As you see the day approaching. Now I'm not trying to jump around here. And I'm going to bring out these verses of this text and God willing, I'm going to not stray from my text. I'm going to stay with my text today. But it occurred to me as I was reading this passage of Scripture and studying on this passage of Scripture that the last clause of verse 25, as you see the day approaching, is really a motivational statement. It motivates us to do something. The little word as starts that off. The subject of the as is you see the day approaching. Now we could go into a study and define the day, but for the purposes of the message today, I would just like to say that there are some days in our life that we see coming. First of all, I'd like to mention that there is the day of our death. It's coming. I was talking to one of the preachers uh, that comes to camp meeting the other day. They were calling and requesting their room. and They said, how are things going? I said, going well. I said, we've lost some uh, due to death uh, since the last time you were here. I said, it's difficult losing your members saying goodbye to them, having to bury them. But we know that if we live long enough and the Lord tarries His coming long enough, we're all going to follow that same path. The Bible reminds us in Hebrews 9, 27 that it is appointed unto man once to die. There's not going to be an avoidance of it. The only way we'll avoid death is if we're alive when Jesus comes. But we're destined for that grave. And so as we see that day approaching, that should motivate us to do some things. 
You know, we, 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 we practice this all the time without even realizing it. We see things approaching and they motiva- motivate us to get prepared. I remember when I was a kid, I played ball. I loved playing ball. And, and uh, man, as I could see the winter starting to turn to spring, I knew it was going to be time for ball season. And boy, I'd get my stuff out and man, I'd start beating that ball in that glove and Back in them days, get a little neat's foot oil and put on my glove and get it ready. You see, I saw the day approaching. I saw the day a ball coming, and so I got prepared for it. You do that all the time. You prepare to go to work. Yeah. Young people prepare to go to school after they get out of high school or, or whatever career they choose. Young people, as they come into relationships and fall in love one with another and uh, decide they want to spend their rest of their life together with that, with that person that they've chosen and that the person that's chosen them. And so they, they see the day of their wedding coming. What do they do? They, they start preparing for it. Uh, nobody uh, nobody uh, throws a wedding together in five minutes. Uh, not many anyway. And, uh, you know, marriage is one thing. Weddings are events now. and uh, Some of them go on for days. But it takes a lot of planning. You get my point that I'm trying to make here. Uh, we see the day of our death coming. Doesn't that motivate us to prepare for it? Do you have a place to be buried? Have you, have you, have you made a will? Ha- have, you, have you put down in writing uh, what your wishes are that you want to have happen to the things that you have in this life after you're gone? You don't want the state to step in and do it for you. Are you, are you prepared for the day of your death from the physical standpoint? But then there's also another day coming that we need to see on the horizon, and that's the day of Christ's return. The day of Christ's return is coming. And we see the day approaching. Well, how, how, do, we, how do we see the day approaching? Well, we see the day of our death coming because we know we're going to die. And the older we get, the more we realize we're dying. <coughs> well, the more that we live and the more we read this book, And the Lord has given us many, many scriptures to show us what things are going to be like when Jesus arrives. Though there's nothing in the Bible that points and says this must happen before Jesus comes, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the return of Jesus Christ. And so we read the Bible and we see, hey, things are coming to pass, things are are arranging themselves in our world today just like the Word of God said they would be. And so He's coming. Don't you think we ought to make a little preparation to do that? We need to make a little preparation for that event. The Bible tells us in Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So there's a a day that Jesus is coming. Now when Jesus comes, it's going to usher in another day that we need to see coming. And that's the day of our judgment. There's a judgment day coming for all of us. Now if you're in here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let me help you understand that your judgment will come. There's a day of judgment for you And there's a day of judgment for those that are born again. Two separate judgments that happen in two separate periods of time. And there's going to be a period of a thousand and seven years between those two judgments. Our judgment will be first. Our judgment will take place right after Jesus comes. When he comes to get us, that that, that, that day approaching of Jesus' return. Well, for us that are born again... That the, our day of judgment is going to be soon as he comes to get us. And we're going to a place called the judgment seat of Christ. The, Bible's, the Bible tells us in Romans 14, 10 that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, those that are born again. Those of you that are lost, your judgment is called the judgment of the great, great white throne. And your judgment will be a judgment of the sins of your life. And you'll have no defense. There'll be no case that will be victorious at that judgment. 
that judgment will be very rapid. The Lord Jesus will say unto you, Depart from me, ye cursed, I never knew you, and you'll be cast into the lake of fire. For the born again ones who go to the judgment seat, our sin will not be on judgment at that, tri- at that judgment because Jesus paid for our sins. But our works that we have done in our life since we have been saved, our motives, the works we've done, all of that will be judged in order to receive or lose rewards. But our entrance into glory forever was sealed the moment we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. So, what does the statement, as you see the day approaching, what does it do to motivate us seeing the day of our death coming? Seeing the day of Christ's return coming? Seeing the day of judgment coming? Well, that's what the preceding verses above verse 25 are all about. And I want to take just a few moments and I want to show you something from these verses. I'd like you to notice with me in verse number 22, verse number 23, and verse number 24, we find a little two-word phrase that's repeated three times, once in each verse. Do you see it? It's the phrase, let us. This is the response to the motivating statement that was made As you see the day approaching, then let us. Let us make our preparation. Now, in these three verses, actually four verses, but in verse number 22, we're going to look at relationship. In verse number 23, we're going to look at duty. And in verses 24 and 25, we're going to look at fellowship. These things need to be intact and need to be practiced and need to be vibrant in our current life as we see the day approaching. First of all, I want you to notice that in verse number 22, the Bible says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's talk about relationship for just a moment. The Bible tells us that as we see the day approaching, let us draw near. Well, what are we drawing near to? You see, the Bible always gives us the object of our faith. The Bible always gives us the object of what we are to believe, to trust, to put faith in. And the Bible makes it very plain to us what we're to draw near unto. We're to draw near unto Christ. And he tells us how we're to draw near to him. Now, if you're lost without Christ this morning and you're not saved and and you're not on your way to heaven, you can be. You know, the Lord will save you today. He desires to save you. He gave his life to save you. It's his will that you be saved. But first of all, we see that the Bible teaches us that if we're going to draw near to Christ, we can't do it but one way, and that's with a true heart. He said, let us draw near with a true heart. Why is it that so many people in the world today, come to altars, weep and cry, make professions, and whatever they got on Sunday morning wasn't even enough to bring them back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. It doesn't do enough for them to get them in God's Word. It doesn't do enough for them to get in prayer. It doesn't do enough for them to get them into the work of the Lord. You know, People who are drug addicts, let me, let me just broaden that out. People who are addicted, there's something that they have to have to satisfy that addiction. 
For the coke addict, it's cocaine that satisfies that, that addiction. They're addicted to it. They have to have that. They have to, they have to get them just enough to give them a little of what they used to call, or maybe they still do, a fix. Same with alcohol or anything else. There's something that people get addicted to and they got to have it to meet a need in their life. You know, Brother Ernest told me one time that he had a young boy in the church over at Box Mountain who came to him and he said, and the little boy was as sincere as he could be. He said, Preacher, I want you to pray that Jesus will save my daddy so he'll stop beating my mama. Brother Ernest said, I'll not pray for that. Because we don't pray for Jesus to save people just to make situations better. We don't pray and ask the God of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who gave his life on the cross to come and save somebody just so they can get a fix, just so they'll get out of trouble, just so something will quit happening. When Jesus saves people, He saves them for one reason, and that's to bring glory and honor to Himself. People say, well, what does it mean to get saved? What well, means to go to heaven? No, that's not what getting saved means. That's the result of getting saved. You go to heaven because you get saved. But we get saved that we may bring glory and honor to the Lord who saved us. That might be why so many come to these altars time and again and they pray prayers but they're just asking for a fix. They're just asking for something to, you know, give me a little touch of God to fix this for me, and then I'm on my way. They're kind of like the townsmen over in Gadara in Mark chapter 5 who witnessed a great miracle, who witnessed the conversion of the meanest man in their town, who was so mean and so hateful that he lived in the cemetery. Nobody could put up with him. They chained him and fettered him and he broke the chains. He was so wild and so strong because he was full of the devil. And boy, I'm sure they wanted that fella out of, the ta- out of their town and out of their neighborhood. And so Jesus did it. And the way Jesus did it, it brought glory and honor to him and The Bible says that man was sitting clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus, begging Jesus to take him with him. You'd have thought revival broke out. But the men that owned the pigs said, get out of here. We appreciate what you did for us. But we still want our pigs. Basically, they were saying, Lord, uh, fix our problem, but let us keep our pigs. Lord, do this for me. Fix me. Fix my problem. But let me keep my sin. Let me keep my lifestyle. My friend, there's a day approaching. The day of your death is approaching. The day of Christ's coming is approaching. The day of our judgment is approaching. The Bible says, let us draw near, but let us draw near with a true heart. May we find a place on the altar if God's dealing with your heart and come to Him in a true and honest fashion and say, Lord, here I am. Not much. Lord, I've got these sins in my life. Lord, may you deliver me for your glory and for your honor. As a child of God, we need to be careful that we don't use our God as a catalog service. When we draw near to God, 
We never need to feel like, oh, we're privileged now. We've been born again, so we can just go hop, skipping, and jumping uh, over into the throne of grace. Isn't that what the Bible says? Come boldly. Uh, that ain't what it means. It means to come with confidence and reverence. And when you draw near to Jesus as a child of God or when you draw near to Jesus as a lost sinner coming and asking for forgiveness, you need to come with a true heart. He says we also ought to come to Christ not only with a true heart, but we should come to Christ with full assurance of our faith in Him. He's the one that can save us. Just as the preacher testified to the history of this church, everything that's been done here, he gives God the credit. And we give God the credit because it's God that did it. Full assurance of our faith that we have in Him that God will take care of us. <coughs> that God will meet our every single need. So we come to Him, the Scripture says in verse 22, with a true heart and full assurance of faith but he also says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Psalms 119, I believe it's verse 9, says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto to the word of God. So the Bible tells us to draw near to Christ, seeing the days approaching May we draw near to Christ with a true heart, with a heart that's full of assurance of faith in Him and true obedience to His Word. May we be obedient to the Word of God. Now, my friend, don't you think those are good things that we should practice? Seeing the day of our death is coming. We know that when we die, we go out to meet God. We know that Jesus is coming again. And when He comes again, we're going to meet Him in the cloud. When Jesus comes again... In the day of our judgment, we'll go stand before Him face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Whether you're saved or whether you're lost, Jesus Christ is the judge. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 5 that the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. We all will stand face to face with Je before Jesus Christ with our life. Seeing that day approaching, the Bible says let's draw near. This has to do with our relationship, establishing it and enhancing it. You can't get any more say, but you can enhance the relationship by our faithfulness to His Word, obedience to His Word, and our trust in Him. Verse 23. Verse 23, we find another let us. And this one deals with our duty as a child of God. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promised. Let's think about our duty for just a moment. As we see, our, as we see the day approaching, as we see the day of our death approaching, as we see His coming approaching, as we see our judgment approaching, it's too late. We've come too far to turn around now. There ain't a spot in the road big enough to turn around. My friend, we got to stay with it. Oh, you mean we got to stay with it to stay saved? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything like that. But we're going to a judgment. And the judgment is going to be the judgment of our work. So we need to, we need to do some drawing near to Him, but we also need to do some holding fast. There are some things we need to hold fast to. Now, that's the reason that we do the church history. You need to remember where you came from. You need to remember what you're a part of. And I, I don't hold this church above other churches that are preaching the Bible and, and living for the Lord. I'm not doing that. I'm not comparing us. We're not in a competition with nobody. Okay? But we need to hold fast to some things because those days are approaching and we need to be prepared for them. Now, first of all, I'd like to say that we need to hold on to our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your testimony should be dear to you. Your testimony should be important to you. 
Your testimony should be crucial to you that you keep that testimony in front of other people that you are a born again believer. And our life ought to back it up. Amen. So he says, let us hold fast our profession. That's our testimony. But he also said in verse number 23 that we should hold fast to our following of Christ's example. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. The Lord never wavered. The Lord left us examples to follow. The Bible tells us in multiple places they use the word example. He left us an example to follow. I'm not much for one on fads. But several years ago there was one got started. You remember it, it was everything from armbands to t-shirts and everything. Had WWJD. What would Jesus do? Now, I don't know how much glory that brought to the Lord. But it sure does get your attention, doesn't it? You know, if you, if you in your life and in the practice of your life, your business dealings, your personal life, your home life, whatever the case may be, I think it's good that before we maybe step out on some things to give a little consideration, how would the Lord handle this? You say, well, how do you know how the Lord would handle it? I got His book. I've got His Word. And the Bible tells us about situations and we go to His Word and the Word tells us how to handle those things. So in our duty as a child of God, we should hold fast our testimony and we should hold fast the example, our following the example that the Lord left, left us. And if we're going to call ourselves Christians, then may we practice being Christ-like. But we also, in these days especially, need to hold fast to our confidence in the Lord. God's not failed us, and God has not left us, and... He's not left us alone and in parentheses in the 23rd verse to put emphasis on that thought the Bible says for he is faithful that promised. Hold fast his testimony. Hold fast his example. And hold fast your confidence in him because he is faithful. Has the Lord ever let you down? <coughs> he's answered prayers different than the way I wanted him to but he's never let me down. And I could never accuse him of such a thing because he is faithful. But look at verse 24 and 25, and I want to finish up here. As you see the day approaching, and I can't emphasize that enough, the day of your death, the day of his coming, the day of your judgment, draw near to Christ. Hold fast the things of Christ. But in verses 24 and 25, he speaks about our fellowship. And he says, let us consider one another. Verse 24, let us consider one another. Give each other some consideration. We live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world today. Look out for number one. My four and no more. That kind of mentality. Whatever happened to considering one another? I think that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is probably about the last institution on God's earth that has people that really consider one another. They give consideration, would even give the time of day in some cases to other people. It's amazing, isn't it? You go into a lot of metropolitan areas, pass people on the street, never even give you an eye glance, much less a word, good morning, how are you? The Bible tells us that we should consider one another. Now he tells us why and he tells us what we're supposed to do in that consideration. He says we're to provoke. Now there's a lot of people that are good at provoking but not in the right way. They know how to provoke a fight, provoke an argument or what have you 
But that's not what he's talking about here. And he defines what we're to consider each other and provoke each other to do, to love and to good works. And so the Bible tells us that we're to edify one another. We're to lift one another up. We are to esteem others higher than ourselves as we see the day approaching. When we read obituaries, most of them, they tell about all that that person did in life. And the saddest ones that I read are not the ones that a person didn't do anything and didn't accomplish anything in their life, but the saddest obituaries I read is that there's no mention of the Lord. There's no mention of church affiliation or any kind of work that they did for God. That's sad. One of the best obituaries I've ever read is in the Bible. It's in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, and it's Joshua's obituary. You ought to go read Joshua's obituary. And you ought to read what he meant to his family. You ought to read over there what he meant to the nation of Israel. And my friend, what he meant to the Lord in the life in which he lived. A life of servitude is one that is a life of sacrifice and giving it away. And the only way to, the only way to get anything is to give it away. And so he says, let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So as I close the message, I bring your attention to verse number 25. And he tells us how we do this. He says in verse 25... He said, let's not be a forsaking people. Let's not be a people that forsake building one another up. Let's not be a people that fake or, or, or forsake our assembling one with another. Let us not be a forsaking people, but an edifying and a building people. And then he says, we ought to be also an exhorting exhorting one another, building one another up, encouraging one another, not tearing one another down. And then he says we're also to be a forward-moving people. He says, and so much the more, moving forward, never doing enough. It's never enough. When do we stop? Provoking one another to love and good works. When have we done enough? When the Lord takes us home. And so he says, as he closes that verse, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray together. May we, Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, as we see the day approaching, we know what's coming. We read about it. We understand it. But Lord, let us be drawing near and let us be holding fast and let us be giving consideration one to another. Lord, let us be obedient to you and to your word as we live our lives, as we see the day approaching. Our Father, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and we prepare to sing a number of invitations, I give out the invitation to one and all. If there's anyone here that is unsaved and does not know Christ, Lord, I pray that they'll do something about that today. I pray they'll draw near to Christ by faith and trust Him. We'll help them with that if they'll just come forward and let us know that's the desire of their heart today. Lord, for the Christian, we too, Lord, need to remember these things as we see the day approaching in our life. May we be prepared for it. Thank you for the good foundation you've built us on of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that solid foundation of Christ that Welcome Doors built on. May we never change or compromise. Have your will and way in the invitation we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake.